Can't hear you, John. That's a great start, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's a really nice introduction. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk tonight about rowing the Atlantic. Um, and from watching the other videos, uh, the other webinars you've been doing, we've put in a little potted history. But cramming 64 years into 10 minutes is a bit of a job, but it's actually been quite fun. Uh, I hope your Carnetti Hill Running Club are in like our efforts to put in your club colours on the opening screen. So <clears throat> here we are. This is 1957. And that rather confused looking chap on the back of the bike is uh, my good self, uh, showing absolutely zero sporting prowess. And it was going to continue like that for quite a few years. My brother in front, on the other hand, is uh, full of beans. I was much, much happier with my head buried in the book and soaking up knowledge as fast as I could. I think when I was uh, about six or seven, I'd already, it might be an exaggeration, I'd already read the encyclopedia back to front and was off again. I just absolutely loved it. I must have had some sporting prowess as uh, here we are on the broads and uh, I've clearly taken the, taken the lead or the rope certainly uh, away from my brother and my sister. Uh, as we guided ourselves into into port. Uh, this may have been a bit of an omen for the future. Who knows? So, <clears throat> fast forwarding to 1978, uh, and I've just qualified as a dentist in Manchester. And I put this photograph up because it just shows how ridiculous we looked in those days. And I think if uh, the COVID lockdown goes on any longer, I think we're all, the gentlemen are all going to look rather similar. Apart from yourself, good self, Ollie, who's had the good sense to actually get, get shorn before then. Uh, so again, I played hockey at university, but my main forte was uh, table football and, uh, and pool. We were, we were just, me and a mate of mine, were just immovable as soon as we got in the pub, which uh, led to an awful lot of uh, good evenings and not much study. But uh, things moved on. I managed to work for a year and because with a couple of mates we were supposed to be getting a Land Rover and going around the world like so many other students at that time and they dropped off and I realised that actually most things in life if you want to get on with them you've just got to pull your socks up and get out there and do them yourself and after two years of work I set off to hitchhike around Africa uh, on my way to Cape Town, which I never got to because I got totally sidetracked. The picture on the left, I mean, you can see the cursor is a couple of budding Samburus with a French friend of mine. And the middle one is the mountain gorillas we saw, or I saw in uh, Rwanda. And the two little furballs there are, are two little tiny baby ones and their game was to creep up on the big silverback and bite his toes. <laughs> And then this huge arm would just descend from above and send them bowling off into the undergrowth. It's the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. Uh, going on to the lower picture is an okapi. I'd be so happy to hear that some any of these are still alive. They're actually only found in the, the forests of uh, northeastern Zaire, which has just been a desperate place for so many years. And that is obviously not in Egypt that actually marks the southernmost point of the Nile. And it's, uh, it's a place in Burundi and marked the end of my journey to try and find its source. Now, it's two things I learned while I was away. One of them was always to push yourself to the maximum extent of your abilities. And with that in mind, I sat on the beach in Kenya and thought, what can be the hardest thing I can do in, in Africa? And about 18 months later, well, 18 months, about a year later, I got back to that, that same beach in Kenya, having achieved as much as I possibly could and had some wonderful times. Uh, this is the other great maxim I've uh, always lived by, is that the further you push yourself out on a limb and just get rid of your personal security, take risks, the greater the reward. And I can wholeheartedly... Uh, recommend those two ways as for 
for budding teenagers, young adults as a way to live their life. Now here we go, here's, here's the plug. Uh, this book only came out about a couple of weeks ago and it contains where I went, where, where did, what is the hardest thing to do in Africa? Well, buy the book and you can find out. And it's available in, on Kindle and, uh, on, and you can get it from Amazon and the paperback. So please enjoy that, especially now we're all locked in. So getting back, getting back to, to UK after learning my traveling spurs, I decided I couldn't hack it at all and uh, set off to go and spend another 18 months traveling east. And you'll see on the and first thing we got to, I got to, so I'm saying, keep saying we, I got to uh, was Nepal. And they just opened up the east side of the Annapurna circuit and things were a little bit uh, a bit rustic as you'll see from the state of the bridge and the central picture is in the north one of the northern valleys and it is the absolute definition of a one-horse town uh, to get there i was armed in, i was on on my own and armed with a uh, my, my trekking permit and you have to learn a few words of, of nepali pretty quickly like food uh, sleep, uh, thank you, and how much. And because these guys had never, had never even seen a tourist before, let alone had anywhere to stay. And of course, the no trip to the east was complete without a picture of the Taj. And I did leave this the seat nice and tidy, ready for Princess Di when she was planting her bottom on it a few years later. So I headed over ended up uh, working in a, in a women's prison in Thailand for a little while for food and lodging and finally got to New Zealand where some kind fella took my rucksack or my belongings from a, from a, um, a cheap hostel along with a diary and, and all my rolls of film. So there is no sequel to the book, so enjoy the first one. Getting back to Manchester. Uh, I got working for the NHS again for two years and just fell in love with diving and like everything else I do I just throw myself headlong into it and just want to do just that thing and dived all around the uh, around the, the uh, British Isles and they are just for my mind is the best place in the world to dive and just absolutely wonderful and I was fortunate enough to be working in West Manchester, so right next to Barton Airport. So what better way to use your lunch hour than to go out and learn how to fly? So I just had an absolute ball for two years, but I spent the, my other time plotting to get out. And uh, finally swung a job in uh, working in, in Africa. Um, oh, one last thing I did do was get married <laughs> just before. <laughs> Uh, just before I left and here's the product the central picture there is my eldest daughter Natasha as you can see if you count candles that's five five there and followed three years later by Jesse Jessica who's on the left hand side and in Malawi it was a it was a fantastic place to live as an expat as, a, as most people who've lived as an expat will uh, tell you and there's a huge lake there, it's 500 kilometers long. And uh, my other great, two great loves there of sports in times were sailing. Uh, and there's a picture wow. of the dart. They sailed, we raced those 500k, as I said. Uh, each year there's a big race, and the winds kicked up massively to the point where they just snap the masts or rip off the steering, or they would just go away entirely. Uh, and even on one occasion, a, a hippo. It was so still a hippo actually swam underneath my boat, which is really quite amazing and quite frightening. Uh, and oh, the second one, thank you, Karen. <laughs> I joined the Plantire Hash, and that set up uh, a lifetime of, uh, of hashing for me, really. And we're still doing that, as, as is witnessed by all the lovely people here tonight. So it wasn't all fun, uh, there was work to be done, and I was the head of the uh, local dental surgery or dental department and here's my two ace helpers Mrs Cadola and Mrs Rogers and we had a staff of about 30 often with a couple of expats as well to help 
and we treated we about we had a catchment of about three million uh, Malawians and one million refugees from the war in Mozambique. So it's not many places you can treat a toothache one minute, go next door and see a gigantic tumour which then needed resection. We had regular uh, twice weekly surgical sessions. Um, and then go next door to the road traffic accidents. And then of course we were, about that time, we were bothered by this little chap on the left, which I'm sure we're, we're all familiar with the pictures we get these days. Uh, in this case it's HIV. Uh, and I was privileged to be able to do quite a bit of the, well, do uh, some research into the orofacial manifestations of AIDS and, and then take that, looking at the early signs and take it around the rest of the Southern African countries, trying to teach them how to, how to adapt their health systems, health services based on our experience. So that lasted 10 years and then coming with it, we had a civil war and things got a little bit unpleasant and came back and I kind of threw myself at my work again because um, we came back quite broke and uh, my then wife decided to wander off to pastures new and I needed a little bit of extra money and as you can see from the top I started collecting a little bit of alphabet soup uh, after my name and developed a, a, a dental implant referral practice which is certainly one of the best in the north of England if not in the entire country and one of the things we we developed me and uh, the my late friend Colin Dean uh, as it is technician uh, was this all on four concept and we took it apart and rebuilt it and um, and sent, then wrote up a series of seven articles in the uh, dental press to teach other people how to do it. It's such a wonderful technique. And we would take people, this lady on the left, who has failing dentition, failing self-confidence, and put all these implants in, and we could do it. We tend to do each jaw separately, but we could do that all on the same day. And leave her coming out with a big smile and... You can see that's the same day because the little red dots still on her nose as I used to, uh, to, to mark her facial height. And she looks great and uh, I'm always pleased with this one. So two children and if anyone here has got uh, children, they will know that uh, dragging them through uh, teenage years is uh, it's not always an absolute ball of fun, but these guys were great. Uh, and I did no sport at all for two years after the divorce and devoted myself to them. And they've turned out fantastically. And here's a, here's a picture, a few pictures on the, the Ferrata on the, in the Dolomites, which is we went with our great friends, the Underhills. I know Kevin's watching. Underhill, uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm being, I'm being, <laughs> being edited here. Um, and so, yeah, everything's, everything's worked really well. And they're, they're, they're both good rock climbers, but this is a way of having a holiday and, and not having the kittens every time they wandered off. So sporty wise, uh, one of the first things I did when I got back to England was to join Cheshire Hash. And uh, that has been a, a major part of my life uh, for, so, for all, all the years since then. That's 24 years now. And through those, I found uh, happiness in the centre there with Karen, who sat on my right, <laughs> looking rather embarrassed. And she's even more embarrassed about this picture of the Himalayan 100 mile stage race, because it's got HRT 2011. She hates that picture. Uh, however, she did come in first lady, so I think it's nice to put it on. And this is just a, a small section of uh, the, the sports I've been doing really since 2002 when uh, I kind of came out of rec reclusement or, um, and got back on with my life and the girls were, were pretty sound and actually joined me on so many different adventures. Um, the only one, another one worth mentioning is uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago we, we canoed down the Yukon 
from Whitehorse to Dawson City, and I hope that your last speaker won't consider us rinky dinks. Anybody who's watching that will know what that means. Uh, well, though, to be fair, we knew absolutely nothing about what we were doing. We just hired it and went for it and learned as much about bears as we possibly could. Um, and then uh, the one worth mentioning is on the bottom left here. We have a, uh, we have a house in, uh, in Tenerife, and this is another great sport. This is following the waterways around the precipitous cliffs, which leads us into all sorts of uh, pickles, but it's enormous fun if you ever get the chance to do it. I can see Nick's watching there as well with Heather when they came to visit us and uh, we took them around in some more bits. So moving on. Rowing the Atlantic. How to get involved? Well, this is where it started. Uh, and funny enough, where is that? Well, it's, the, it's actually the North Pole. And the reason for that is, the, is that the, the person I met on the way up, on the, on the, on the airport, on the way up here uh, to there, uh, was a guy called Guy Munnock. And we've been great friends ever since. And this is 2006. And he wanted to celebrate his 67th birthday in style. And uh, as a bit of a swan song, he'd, I don't think he's had enough, but he's, he's had enough of big adventures and he wanted to do something completely different and invited me along. So it gives me a great excuse to show some pictures of the North and South Poles because he came there afterwards. And uh, so here we go. This is a little bit of uh, the North Pole. This is landing uh, on a small Russian jet. And you can see huskies. Now, you, you don't get huskies. They're not allowed on the Antarctica. So you can immediately see this is the North Pole. And this is Camp Barneo, where we were staying initially. And it's a, a temporary camp. It's only set up for a couple of months each year. Um, and this is us getting our, getting our gear together. Now, normally, you, when you're doing the last degree to the poles, you get helicoptered in or airlifted to one degree from there, which is about 90 miles or so. But in this case, the, uh, the Russian pilots were <laughs> really, really anti. And they just wouldn't come out. They, they were just going in there. They went inside their, uh, these bubbles, and this is there, you see there, do not entry, we are sleeping. And that was about it. Actually, I don't think they were sleeping more from actually hitting the vodka every night. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't get going. So we just set off from there. So actually, we, we probably did as close to a, a, a shoreline approach as possible. So two big things with the North Pole. One of the uh, leads where, where the ice opens and you just hope that your skis are long enough. Personally, I would have had another couple of meters on the ski on the skis just to be safe, uh, because it's a real a moment, shall we say? Every time you go across these, you just don't know. You'll see in the bottom of the picture there that's newly formed ice, and you really, really don't want to fall in. And then other times the leads open really widely. And you've just got to go around unless you've got special gear to go across. Now, the other thing on the North Pole is those big ice plates crunch up together and produce pressure ridges. And sometimes the only thing you can do is just take your skis off and just manhaul these, these things across, usually with a mate behind, giving a bit of a push. And it's a, it's a great way of warming up. You just don't need that many clothes, even though it's minus 30 or so, uh, because when you're working that hard. Um, and like on the North and the South Pole, it's so critical to be organized. Uh, you, this is where Guy and I really hit it off, is that we're both super organized, great with admin and each time you stop, you have a few seconds just to get your warm stuff on. And then one of us, we'd go around, we had a really good, uh, good regimen for getting the tent up. And one of us then go in and start warming it up while the other guy went around and packed it all and made sure it was sturdy. And this is absolutely critical to survival in these, uh, in these temperatures. 
and there we are. There is the North Pole with a bit of more advertising, but of course, I'm retired. I don't need to worry about this anymore. And, and actually, the practice is now owned by Booper. Uh, that's me on the, on the screen's right, and there's a guy on the left, as you can see, we're two absolute man mountains. We barely touch five foot seven, about stacked one on top of each other. So here we go, let's nip down to the other end of the world, uh, literally. Um, Guy is a reluctant mountaineer, but I managed to twist his arm into doing Mount Vincent. Uh, that's, for, that's for another day. And we, this uh, top left here is uh, Tierra del Fuego and Punta Arenas, where the, the flight goes to Union Glacier. Uh, actually, it's not Union Glacier, it was Patriot Hills when we, when we did it. It's actually moved now, which is much better, actually. It's much more reliable. And then you get a flight up to one degree away from the South Pole. And that's the big, there's always Russian jets for some reason. Uh, they're absolutely stripped completely bare on the inside. And they're quite exciting. There's no, there's no frills in these things. Uh, and this is it lying, there's Patriot Hills in the background. And this is the ANI camp, uh, which is there all summer. They strip it down and bury it actually the huge un underground caves and put e we put everything in there uh, in fact the year we were there we were almost the last off uh, because we were obviously a bit worried that we we're actually going to get over winter there if things were that bad they couldn't send the jet uh, and in here these are beds in them you wouldn't believe and they have a special english chef to do the most fantastic food and as you can see this is new year's eve and the guys on the bottom left here are actually the pilots who <laughs> you didn't want to fly the next day really and fortunately my face didn't quite get stuck to this block of ice and this kindly gentleman was helping me by pouring vodka through the middle of it to help free up my uh, my lips that are sealed onto it at least that's what he said so here we are uh, this has now been dropped off uh, about 90 odd miles from the pole and once again these the guide has this nice fancy one and we end up with these little plastic ones but boy they're a lot lighter and uh, you, you can thankfully when you've got to just pull the damn thing day after day for 12 14 hours at a time uh, and then the, the plane leaves you and then suddenly you're on your own it feels quite lonely and and that's it uh, and I'm going to say that that really is it. That is skiing the last 90 degrees. You get in a little line and you shuffle forwards on your skis. Uh, I can't tell you how boring that is. It sounds awfully glamorous and fun and wonderful, but it is intensely boring. Uh, with one little caveat, of course, it's minus 49 degrees. So any little slip you have or... Uh, or mistake you made, you'll soon pay for it, or possibly with your life. Anyway, that's, I'm, as you can see, there's four of them. I'm at the back here taking pictures and wondering how to pass the time. So what I do is, after about the second or third day of doing this, I started closing my eyes for one song of a, on the iPod and then open them at the end and going, whoa, where are they? And not too far. So do it with two songs and they're a bit further. Again, boredom sets in, try three songs. Okay, they're just on the edge of your visibility. So I thought, well, four's, four's about right. And it's really hard, just moving forward, shuffling along with the same sort of speed. And unfortunately, the fourth song was Stairway to Heaven, which is not a good choice. But I did what I did, as always I say, just do the hardest thing you can. I kept my eyes completely closed. Uh, foolishly because I opened them and I couldn't see anybody and looking down the wind had picked up a little bit and it was on much harder ice I could barely see where I'd come from I had no idea where they were there's only one way to find out and that's to ski back and follow my track as best I could to the junction and find it but thankfully I just saw this little tiny scouring in the in the ice surface as four of them been passed and I arrived back to my place, maybe 
10 minutes later, but they were 10 very long minutes, bathed in sweat. And these guys didn't even know I'd gone anywhere. And they just settled in again. So four days, oops, let's, let's get it back on. Next. Oh, let's say, sorry, I'm just gonna go back slightly because this is a cracking picture that just shows you just how cold it is. Everything, everything congeals. And it, it's nice during the day, but at night when it all melts, it's really unpleasant. <laughs> and you have to sort of wipe it away and uh, clean it up as best you can. Um, talked about the importance of admin. Uh, once again, I was with guys, so we had no problems whatsoever. It was, a, it was good to be with someone you trust all these times. Teamwork administration is so critical especially in this sort of temperature you have literally seconds to get your big parka or on your big duvet type jacket there's the american base we finally arrived and there's a huge runway there uh, which is about a mile and a half long you seem to be forever skiing down this, the length of it and they let you in for about a two-hour tour and they give you tea uh, take you to the cafe and biscuits or cookies uh, you can post stuff in the, the post office and just when you're getting yourself nice and cool and comfortable they kick you out again and you have to go and get out and stick your tent up right in front of them uh, which is it's nice of them to let us in but after that they wash their hands of you. you you're on your own jack and as you can see I've spent hours carefully preparing my advertising for the North Pole and it was three years later. So two, two poles down and I was pretty involved with doing the seven summits. Uh, I had to do Denali three times and believe me that's not pleasant. It's a long hard slog up to high camp only to get turned away twice uh, and I can go it twice as well. Uh, but I finally became uh, the 37th person in the world to complete the Explorer's Grand Slam. Now that's the, the last degree. And I know from one of your previous uh, talks, uh, Ollie tells me it was a few years ago, but he did Kosciuku as the Australasia one. So here's a little sample of Karsten's Pyramid. Uh, firstly, on the left, you can see you actually trek in boots. It's so wet going through hot wet forest it's it is a wonderful wonderful thing i love i love what uh, jungle and I have, i've spent ages and ages in the, either the amazon zaire or um, or malaysia sumatra java and this one is so benign there's nothing nasty in it there's no snakes there's no spiders there's no nothing bites you it's just fun just getting wet and mucky and there you know, at the end of it you have this fantastic wall of rock uh, which is not too hard. It's certainly not up to Ollie's standards of uh, you know high high adrenaline, hard hard climb. This is this is relatively easy. It doesn't look it from there, uh, but it is enormous fun. And on the right there is the is the guy I bought this. Uh, I think it's the it's the uh, West Papuan uh, version of a woolly warmer. I don't think it's going to go down well in Edinburgh, but. It knows this one is actually sitting on, my, on our bedroom wall. So that's the preamble. And now I'd like to show just a, a 30 second um, video because we're now going to get involved with the, with the boat uh, trip across, across the Atlantic, which set off in December. And as most people have not even seen a, a boat trip before, or let alone seen one on the, on the ocean, just how violently they get thrown around. So apologies for the quality as it comes over Zoom. And this one is from 2017, uh, but it does show the pictures from the, about the boat really well. And, way. and this really happens and you're quite right it is way too scary it, 
it's to get thrown straight into that is absolutely monstrous not only in terms of just sheer fear <laughs> are you going to survive uh, the seasickness everything um, and it's, it's, it, it just uh, crystallizes everything you're worried about so here was who are we? we we were a team of four there's only three of us there this is uh just after my daughter jessica's wedding we went and uh, took some pictures in a in a one of the, one of the ponds in north london and it's, it's a cracker because it's got uh, uh, my hat on which figures in our logo uh, that's mike on the left who's a great friend from malawi guy in the middle as i've talked about from the north and south poles and also everest and this to rest of the talk is really to talk about you know how did three people here who really don't know anything about ocean rowing how do we get across safely and keep our wives happy so our goals first of all it was the end of 1918 uh, well august 18 and the idea was to enroll the following year that's uh, last year so we'd chosen it talisker whiskey atlantic challenge is a race that's run since about 2011 and we wanted to be the guinness beat the guinness world of records but i've been the oldest team of four to row across an ocean and the current holders the then holders were only somebody who did uh, talisker whiskey challenge two years before and we would have, we beat them by about three or four years uh, there's no way we are going to win this thing we're a bunch of old duffers and these guys are uh, sponsored by the army the navy and they spent four or five months doing nothing but train so we were there to compete complete all we had to do was stay alive till the other end which is as <laughs> i think his name in itself and arrive in Antigua safe and importantly and still be friends putting four guys in a boat for up to 40 50 days there's always going to be a few squabbles. We wanted to be friends when we came to the other end. Here's a few race facts. Uh, we, Mike's an accountant. He reckoned we did about two and a half million oar strokes. We were out there longer than most. And the, the rotor is interesting <clears throat> in that we were two hours on, two hours off for 24 hours a day. And this is probably the most significantly, significant fact it is crucifying for the first few days you don't know whether you're coming or going you're frightened of the sea you some of the guys are being seasick and it just upsets everything all your circadian rhythms are upside down and being shaken around along with the rest of your internal organs i like this uh, these are the facts from uh, from uh, talisker and uh, me and of course me and guy both climbed everest so we, we were well suited to that one and as regarding charities i'll show a slide later which has uh, our two chosen charities which was open arms malawi for me and mike and the other two were ex uh, army uh, they so they were supported blind veterans it's a deep ocean well that's no surprise what what is worrying is when you've got to jump off off the boat and then clean the bottom when you know there's big fish in there with large teeth and it can be quite quite daunting when you have no idea and it's five miles to the bottom and uh, the last little fact there rowers can experience waves up to 20 foot high well we were we were told when we set off we were going to be in four and a half meter waves right from the outset and we had to row south uh to get away uh clear eliero uh well since we leave we left um left la gomera and that meant not running with the waves but actually going across them and that was a nightmare to start with because you were just getting tossed around even more and a four and a half meter wave was the average so some of these things were monsters uh, what it did do was it was restored when the boat survived and we survived it made us so confident with the rest of the race so we were chucked in the deep end and really felt good about everything there's a few funny things that happened on the race so that one team arrived with a blue marlin beak and they'd heard a thud in the night and had no idea what it was until they got there and found this thing i'm sure the fish itself was missing it by that time 
And the other really most common question we were asked, what do you do about the, uh, the loo? Well, very quickly, we use pee bottles. Uh, it's impossible to stand on the side uh, just for the danger or just trying to maintain your balance. Uh, so pee bottles are the best thing. And as regards the number twos, we had there's only one spare area on the boat when you've got four on it and that's just in front of the stern cabin so the every time you went to the to do your uh, business you had a you had a cast of two or an audience of two uh, always and that's it can be a bit off-putting should we say but we'd we'd, we'd spent five days on the boat uh, without getting off uh, in our training so we we'd got to grips with this quite quickly each rower lose weight. Well, I, I lost about five kilograms, disappointingly. I mean, for the size of me, I was thought I would lost at least 10. Uh, my, my own personal uh, reason for, to, to my, my feeling is that with no alcohol at all on the boat, which was probably the first time in years, I think my liver was, was regrowing faster than I was losing fat. And that's why I only lost five kilograms. And a couple of the other guys, uh, one guy lost 15 and the other one's just about 10 ish. So preparation. How do we how do we get to get to the end safely? Well, this is one of the reasons that uh, the girls, our wives were so happy. Well, so happy they were happy that we were going rather than on our own. We actually joined the race was that there's a mass of rules and regulations um training in every, every single aspect of the boat the individual's team was all regulated and that gave them huge confidence there's also two two yachts would uh, would travel down from la gomera in stages and with visitors on the way so i'm going to look at these five items in in uh, in uh, order so team members there we are now there's four of us uh, steve joined later that's steve in the middle there and importantly you can see the the ages because as i said before all we have to do is stay alive to the other end and we've cracked it the rules masses and masses of rules the mandatory equipment list you'll see in a minute is just uh, so exhaustive uh, but the one thing that we all had to understand is this safety at sea and that was the health and safety lines that you always had them on every time you got out to deck. The first thing you did was clip on and the hatches closed at all times. The two rules, the two cardinal rules we had, and because a rogue wave can just first straight and fill your hatches. And if it's the back cabin, that's all your electrics gone. And suddenly you're in a, you're in a, a, a major problem. If you read the books of people who've, uh, uh, across the Pacific and things. This is a single critical item where they've failed and actually just got away with their lives. Uh, emergency procedures, everything was uh, really well documented. Going on to the boat itself. Uh, there's two real men in the UK these days. So there was a third. Uh, the middle one is a guy called Justin Adkin and Karen sporting the boat there as Poppy um beautiful handmade boats but he's producing one or two a year uh, they really are beautiful works of art uh, but the word boats that we chose in the end was the Rannick. Uh, again magnificent uh, design really really good and and, and as you see you saw from the uh, the pic the video they are ultra safe really really good and you have massive confidence in them which you, you need uh, and the one on the right is uh, the Swiss girls. It's a new, it's a new design, and they're, they're a team of four Swiss girls who came across with one of those. So looking at the boat again, you can see it with all its uh, glory. That's our boat. Uh, lots of certification, as you can imagine. But a lot of these you just need for a boat anyhow. Um, if you're uh, if you're sailing or rowing off off the UK. And you can see it's 28 feet long, um, which is not very much. And you can see, you can also see you can appreciate that the cabin at the back there. You actually the guys who were in there. I was in the front with Mike. We had the we had the palace with the ensuite, 
uh, Guy and Steve were in the back and their feet have to come underneath the rowing deck. Um, looking at the boat still, uh, we had to, obviously again, my, it was my job to get all the loose equipment together. Mike, so you'll see in a minute, he did the food. And this is, before we left UK, we had a preliminary inspection, and then this is La Gomera. Um, we had to get everything out, uh, and so they had to count everything. Everything was checked, which is onerous, a little tedious, but extremely good. And our wives were very, very keen that we did everything by the book to make sure everything was on it. I'm not going to read you through this, this lot. Cooking actually was just boiling water. We just had jet boils. And the food we'll go to in a minute. Looking at the individuals, we also had to uh, do lots of training. And we spent 10 days in uh, Tynmouth in Devon, which is a great place uh, to, to spend a, a week or so, uh, picking up all these RYA, uh, Royal Yacht Association certificates. And we had a couple of days uh, from one of the Atlantic campaigns guys come and give us an ocean rowing course as well. So we, we really felt an awful lot more confident after we come, come out of there. Clothing. Uh, this is a real issue because um, people often ask us, you know, what did you take? Because one of, the, one of the main myths or stories is that people do it naked. Well, I can tell you what, it's bloody cold. <laughs> you don't want to do this naked. Uh, certainly for the first month we had. This is the, the picture there is from the support vessel, the yacht that came past us. Unfortunately, in the middle of the night, we were desperately disappointed because we wanted a it come, to come past during the day with massive waves and get some really good video footage. And that's all they came up with. What it does show though is Mike and me uh, with our heavy duty clothes on, uh, jackets on. And apart from that, we had a, a very light fleece uh, and then two, uh, two pairs of shorts basically and two t-shirts and you washed one and the other more the other one and that was it really there's no room for anything else uh, and then halfway through we managed to get a you know we had a pair, pair of undies uh, a new clean t-shirt and another pair of undies uh, another another t-shirt that was the luxury from reaching halfway safety equipment i talked about this earlier and there's the there's the uh, this leash that we had to put on we were wearing a harness that's a PLB, personal locator beacon. And this end will go on to there. And so it's always kept on to two points at all times. Uh, as I said before, absolutely critical because you just never knew when something was going to try and you're going to roll or pitch. And you had to walk up and down the boat quite a bit, always on the sides. So you just didn't know. Food. The the race requirement was 60 days um, at 60 calories times your weight which for me was about 65 kgs but you can imagine some of these guys are about six foot five something that strange enough one team of submariners were the biggest of all you, you just can't credit that and i dread to think what they had to take in terms of food uh, on that boat and they had the same size boat as we did uh, so with there you can see the, uh, the orange ones are Real Termat. They are a Norwegian dried food and that is absolutely the Rolls Royce of, uh, of dried food. It's absolutely fantastic. We actually look forward to meal times. Uh, and here are, oops, I'm done with it again. Oh, no, let's go back one. That's interesting. And here's a snack pack that we made up and vacuum packed, uh, filled full of... Uh, Donations uh, currently sponsored by Kellogg's. Uh, I mine were just mostly peanuts, um, Bombay mix, the Kellogg's things uh, wonderfully, and some artificial food, uh, some powders, um, calorie replacements, and M&Ms. And boy, I used to look forward to the M&Ms. I would have to go through looking for them. Little treats. Water. Uh, we had a Schenker uh, water maker on board and this thing could spit out 40 litres 
in about an hour and a half when it's working well. It's really a fantastic bit of kit. A bit temperamental, I was continually tinkering with it and my job was Mr. Fix It. Uh, but it, it performed and admirably the whole way through, which meant that you could wash your clothes, you could wash your body and get the salt off all the time without worrying about it. So looking at the team, the last bit here, is it's a huge amount of work and uh, Guy is very good at that. He's the chairman of several several boards and so he, he, he coordinated our efforts and was in charge of navigation. My job with loose equipment, medical and general maintenance. Mike looked after the food and Steve's in the communications industry and he's a, a past electrician. So we had a really good, we had a really good team working together. The guy there is Stokey Woodhall, who's a bit of a legend, and he was our, our um, um, weather router. So each morning, Guy or Steve would talk to him and he would give us a heading uh, for the day, uh, so maybe about 300 miles away, so we could work on that. Um, the last comment there is we had to do 120 hours, and I think each year they try and increase this. Uh, but it's actually well worth it. You really need to spend time on the boat before you throw yourself out there, even though you just have no idea what the Atlantic can throw at you. Nothing around the UK is going to prepare you for that. Some setbacks. Um, on our way, this is late 2018, and we're running on our way to uh, Pirin, in uh, to meet a load of friends to do the sky runner race and karen and i were driving and i took a tumble in uh, montenegro on the left there uh, and then <laughs> with a half an hour later i hit my face and i thought oh well, okay never mind and then half an hour later i took another one and straight on the same place and only this time did it much much more properly and broke my wrist at the same time what a nuisance and I finished the run, it was still, I was still about eight miles away from getting back to the, where we parked the car and I had another mile to, from all my turn off. But the Pyramid was really interesting, we st I still did it, but descending, I was, I was like an old girl, and I was saying, that's, that's no offence to the feminist, I was like an old whatever. <laughs> um, but and then to train through and waiting for my wrist to get better so I could start training again. It took oh, about two or three months to produce and put any weight on it. And then about July, uh, April, May time, I thought, oh, I'm strong enough now. I went and bought myself a brand new barbell, loads of big weights. I've been watching the videos of all the other guys doing it. About the second time I picked it up, bang, and uh, slipped a disc straight through here. And you see the, the bit where it's dislocated out and it's pressing on the spinal column. And this is not a lot of fun. Uh, so it does teach you one good thing, and that's read the instructions first before you start trying to lift these things. Uh, and this really knocked me, knocked me out of the game I, I, for a while. I'd spent uh, the bigger uh, section of the training had been done, but the second time we went out around from, the boat was based just near uh, Portsmouth, I was reduced to just navigating and I missed all our second half of our training. Uh, what I could do though was I could swim. And so in August I went over to uh, the Dardanelles. It was one of the things I've always wanted to do was swim across from uh, Europe to Asia. So what, what, who wouldn't? Uh, it's three and a half miles and about 10% of people get swept down and have to be picked up by these uh, by these fishing boats and I just made it across by the skin of my teeth. I'm not the fantastic swimmer, I just, I just thought this was just a wonderful thing to do. And as I've said before, the further you go out on a limb, this was a, this was a rotten trip, it's about a week of travel and Karen decided to stay at home and I fell into a bad crowd while I was out there. And these, these awful people invited me back with them on their on their uh, private jet and so here you are here's tangible proof that the further you put yourself out of the limb you the greater the reward and this i'm quite sure will never happen to me again in my life as so i just love sharing these photos 
And here we are. This is back to reality. We've uh, we've arrived now. This is uh, you have to be in La Gomera uh, twelve days before the race starts, and you can see the the clouds are over the top. We had lousy weather, and it was building all the time. And there's our boat. Uh, I hope you can see all the uh, sponsors. Uh, we were so well looked after financially and. Uh, by other people like Marmoth and Premier Marinas, Kellogg's, and in terms of helping us with berths and, and the boat itself. We had great, great sponsors. Um, and there's our, there's our flag waving, I hope. There we are. And we're, we're looking, we're actually looking the part. We're really feeling much, much more confident and getting ready for the off. Uh, we did one pre-race row, so we could uh, get out there and test out the power anchor. This is this gigantic uh, sail. And sorry about the judderiness, but that's us being videoed for the, for uh, Atlantic campaigns. So I'll just tick that straight off because we go off pretty quickly. And we'll flash forwards to the 12th of December and we're off. Race start, and that's where we're leaving. It's uh, La Gomera Harbour. And again, I must apologize for the state of these videos on Zoom, but it's just too good a chance to, to watch us leaving. This is, this is Karen and uh, the other wives videoing us, and it's a, it's a really emotional time. You're leaving everyone behind. The wind was such, and we knew we were going to hit four and a half meter waves. So this was a one-way trip. We are not coming back unless something awful happened the first few days. You get a little glimpse of some of the size of the opposition there. They're huge, these guys. <laughs> we didn't do any arm wrestling before we left. And here we are, just as we are leaving the bay and rowing three up. This is a bit of a rarity. In fact, this is the only time we did it. Um, and doing pretty well. We caught up the Bucks boys uh, and actually overtook someone, I think, for the very first and only time <laughs> in the entire race. Out at sea, massively important to look after yourself. And this is what happens. Obviously, you, you're working two hours on, two hours off. You have very little time to, to do anything. Uh, when, you, when you go off your shift, you have about 20 minutes to basically get your clothes off and start airing the bits that need airing. Um, even when the first month it was so cold, it was really hard. Uh, looking after your hands, we had hand pads, but you really need to toughen up your hands as well when there's salt water and everything going on. These get incredibly painful. Uh, bottoms, as I said, the only way to do it is to have lots of uh, pseudocrem and talc and then foot power, Scott Dolls, Dr. Dr. Skulls, good foot powder for your feet and keep your clothes clean. You really have to look after your hygiene. We had uh, hand washes, I'm sure we're all familiar now with antiseptic hand, hand washes everywhere. As soon as you went to the loo, straight in there. So, so important. And our routines were, again, looking after our individuals, but the boat also needs looking after. It's not just our bottoms, it was the, the boat's bottom. Uh, Steve was in charge of the electrics and he was always keen that we had the solar panels completely clean. That was Mike's job because he had the longest arms he could reach. At the bottom of the boat was my realm, um, so I'd dive over there and clean all these guys off. And this was after two weeks of growth because we hit some, some really bad eddies and we were making slow progress. And this is the sort of thing you get, and you've really got to get off there and screen them all up, clean them all off. And waste management, equally important, because obviously we believe in clean oceans and absolutely nothing was to thrown away. There's plastic, anything, everything had to be bagged up. And, and very importantly, the race organisers, when you get to the other end, they want to see everything and make sure nothing's been thrown overboard, which is highly commendable. So the other things we get asked, uh, 
what's the high points? Well, lots. I mean, just so many. We were unlucky not to see many whales, but there's a whale. And this little chap, or this big chap, I should say, came close and closer and then actually dived down below the boat. And then you're thinking, no, no, don't come so close after really wishing it better and closer all the time. And we saw one sea turtle, which was magnificent. Uh, three dolphins came over, took one sniff of the front and went away. I don't know what the heck we've been, <laughs> we've done wrong, but that was all we saw. Uh, while some of the other teams were out there with hundreds of dolphins and actually swimming with the whales as well. We saw none of that, so it was a great shame. For me, the, the big things here were riding the huge waves. I absolutely loved it, I have to say. There's absolutely nothing quite like it. You've got this gigantic wave bearing down on you and then timing the big pull of your oars to try and maximise your surfing on it. And it's just magnificent. It's, you have a smile there from ear to ear doing this. It seems crazy because if it goes wrong, you can have an awful problem. But it's just the boat's really riding well. Little things uh, really cheer you up finding a hot a load of hot water in your thermos after you've had a really rough shift and your mate as in my case mike has put that in without even telling you that's a really nice thing to do and something which really is nice is to reciprocate um, <clears throat> one of the big the big things in uh, for me was uh on the on a completely calm line there were them were was when it's so so dark and there's no no uh, moon around all the stars are out in the middle of the ocean you can imagine it's no light pollution and you can barely see the difference between the sea and the and the sky uh, so it's all one 360 degrees and in a calm sea you, you can barely hear your oars as they're entering if you're quiet with your rowing it really feels like you're just rowing through the galaxy. It is absolutely magnificent. Uh, it's rather like something that Terry Pratchett would be proud of writing, or the late Terry Pratchett. Um, so that's a, one of the real highlights for me. The other one with moon bows, uh, the opposite when you've got a quiet night um, and then there's a big rain squall comes over, which is far more frequent and it's with a full moon and then you get this black and white rainbow, which is called a moon bow. So it's so rare and uh, yet just so magnificent. And of course, arriving in Antigua and the high points, meeting up with the wives and families, it's uh, your loved ones, it's uh, really quite indescribable. And Christmas. We, uh, we spent Christmas Eve and the, you know, Karen and the other girls had put in lots of little presents and silly things. I shan't even mention the blow up uh, doll that Guy got from his wife. So fortunately, I didn't mention those, I don't know they could. We were going to put that up in one of the rowing positions on arrival. We changed our minds. We weren't that brave. The low points. Ah, oh, this, uh, this whole business we were told about, uh, oh, don't worry, John, you just need, you don't need a sleeping bag. It's boiling hot. It's so hot. You've just been a roast. You've got a week of feeling a little chilly. My backside. It was cold, it was freezing, it rained, there was cloud. We hardly got any sun for about a month. Uh, and of course, you, with your two hours off at night, you really need to sleep. And you find you've, you've got to take your clothes off, as you said, to dry out the bits of uh, the important bits and then lie there naked on the floor of your cabin. Um, because it's the only way to make it. And you just end up curling up in the fetal position, <laughs> trying to sh shiver yourself to sleep, which is not a great deal, for, especially for the first week when you're desperately short of it. The other big thing was the ocean eddies. I mean, the, the wind's going one way, um, maybe coming from the south. You want to go southwest, and maybe the ocean, the entire ocean, is just moving northwards. And this because these create these ocean eddies and, and they are a disaster because you're not going anywhere. At best, you can row to about three, say two knots. And with these, you'll be lucky to make a half to 2.75. And that's dipping your oars in together 
as, and pulling as hard as you can for two hours flat. And then you go off completely exhausted and then come back on and two hours, two hours later, you pop your head out of the cab of their hatch and say, what's it like? And they say, just the same. And you know, you've got another two hours of just rowing through treacle. And this can go on for days. It's not something at all pleasant. It just, uh, it absolutely awful. The injuries, oars and rowing, well, that's a whole a new, a whole new ball game. When we were rowing off the Isle of Wight and stuff, it's fine. It's, everything's in lovely. It's just so nice, even in what you think is a big sea. But you get into the middle of the Atlantic and that oar becomes a homicidal maniac. It's, it catches the little flat end on the other end, as I'm reliably called a blade. Is one end, and when the when the way a rogue wave comes and catches it, the other end is awfully close to your body, and it's going to hit you, and give you the most enormous clout on the shins, uh, which breaks the skin. It can hit your knee so hard, and I've got bad hips. It drives your femur up onto your hip with such a wallop, you squeal with pain. It's, it's really sudden, uh, or it's trying to disembowel you if you're just in a different part of the stroke or worse castrate you which is just not funny um we lack of lack of sleep we talked about and then oh this this a rogue wave we just mentioned there's always one you've where rode for two hours and you're nice and dry and you just can't wait to get in your pits it's really tired and then this thing comes across and soaks you from tip to toe and you just say oh thank you so much god that was really nice. Thank you. Please do that again. Breakages were, were just a constant pest. Uh, the one of the, the rather fuzzy black and white there is of one of the rowing gates. And, and that's, as you can see, if, if you get broadside on and the oar has slipped into the water and gone down, it's pinned there. And what happens is it completely wrecks the rowing gate or it can just bend the plate the rowing gate's on. And basically you can't use that again. Um, so it it's happens all too often. We lost two bent plates and I think all the rowing gates except one uh, were damaged in some way. So we really limped in and it was my job to try and fix and I was constantly hanging over the side of the boat try and un unscrew these things and change them with with not enough spanners to that actually fit so it's trying to hold it on with a pair of pliers so it was uh, knowing that if we drop something we were in real trouble and then you're going on to the heat and the humidity for the second month so the first month was cold and then it just got red hot and we were roasting alive in the in the cabin so the complete opposite here's the one of the nice things about the, the route across was uh, we could follow it with the YB races and the, all those little things were updated every day so all the people at home could sit and watch it. Um, they all became dot watchers and I think they, they were up and uh, refreshed every four hours and they were actually up and finding out where we were on the waking up in the middle of the night to follow us and all the wives were great with this and then emailing us and telling us quite what had been going on and here we are we're closing in on this now and this is a, a support boat to come out and that's Antigua in the background and well, there's bronzed and rather thinner bodies coming in and the finish line uh, finally we'd, we'd hit uh, English, Har English Harbour and this boat on the left is the media boat which whizzes round you and screams at you to go woo and wah and all the rest of it to get some good photos. And finally, the last few paddles and then uh, this, is, this is it. And there we are arriving up the coast and being handed our, uh, and handed our, our banner by the guy who owns, who owns Atlantic Campaigns. So we can get this shot and, uh, and we are delighted, I can tell you, we are delighted to be there. <laughs> that wasn't posed at all. Maybe the shouting was and raising the fist, but they were absolutely delighted to be there. And important things first was to meet our lovely ladies who uh, who'd been waiting for us for longer than we planned. 
Uh, there's me on with Karen here, there's Steve, Mike and Guy. And then onto the business in hand. <laughs> we were, we, were been, we spent so long talking about what you're going to eat. Um, and they give you this hamburger, which actually went completely cold, but some kind soul went and got us a pizza, uh, for which we're extremely grateful. And yes, we're still friends. Uh, that was our, our uh, if you remember back to our goals, one of them was to make sure that we were still friends when we got there. And, and there we are, this is our party. The, the, uh, the race itself we did in 49 days. And that was great because we arrived. And we're st all still alive, as you can see. So Atlantic campaigns have entered to, to the Guinness Book of Records our time. But I do understand that a French team has actually pipped us to the post and I think they're about a year and a half, two years old than we are. So we may not have got it. We're going to have to leave it and wait and find out what Guinness uh, decide. It's with them to adjudicate. Um, I did say I'd put on a slide with the charity and this is how much we've, we've raised for them. Um, and we're delighted with that, absolutely delighted with it. Uh, it's a massive help for both two, two extremely worthy causes. Uh, and I know that this, this is all about Maggie's uh, for Carnethy and a uh, very moving account from Ollie, uh, and which is absolutely right and just, but here's two other, two other good, good, uh, good causes. So one of the things Ollie did at the end of his talk Whereas he sort of said, well, look, come on, don't waste your life. Give yourself, push yourself hard. And I think actually we share a common, a common goal there. It's, it's been the, my, my modus operandi all my life. And this is, would we do it again? We often get asked this, would you want to go again? The Indian Ocean seems a lot smaller. The Pacific is just outrageous. It's a six month trip, so I don't fancy that. But the Indian if anyone out there with a hundred thousand pounds, I think Karen and I would love to take them up on it. Uh, we already had uh, quite a few things planned for this year. And of course, COVID's arrived. Um, we were supposed to be cycling from Cairns to Broome, that's 3,800 uh, kilometers. And actually I've been in contact with the Cairns because the, we have a bike there we're, we're due to pick up and begging them, can you just keep in the storeroom just a little bit longer, like a year, please. And in August, we were supposed to be climbing the north face of uh, Mount Kenya. So uh, that's all on the off, uh, all in the air, really. So what we have done, of course, is we've looked at other options which don't involve flying. And so these are, our, these are our latest plan is to, again, thanks to good old Ollie. Eh? He's, he's, he's going to be embarrassed about all this now. One of the things he did was uh, to ride the raid, which is uh, taking all the big high points from the Tour de France uh, in, in, I think, less than, less than 100 hours. And we quite fancy that, but being us old folks, you know, we knew we need something else to keep us going. And so we fancied going across and doing the, uh, the GR5 from Lake Geneva down to Nice. Uh, and when we finished it, we might, we might take a weekend off. And the final one of Ollie's challenges, post COVID, I am desperate to renew my grandchild uh, juggling skills. Although by the time we get to see them, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to manage. These guys will all have grown up uh, beyond my capability to lift them all up together. Uh, and there we are guys, That's, uh, thanks very much for listening. I've left my uh, contact number at the bottom there and of course a plug for the book which is on Amazon Adventures in Africa and there we are. Well, John that was fantastic very very inspiring thank you thank you very much and um, 